Warning, 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 warning. Given that the term of former IBAC Commissioner Robert Redlich ended at the end of 2022, it's a little disappointing that the Victorian Government have only now gotten around to advertising for Redlich's replacement. The wheels have been moving very slowly there. Over a month ago, the Attorney-General put it down to the Government entering the caretaker period before the November election. But as the Operation Daintree report shows us, all sorts of things can be pushed through before and no doubt after the caretaker period if there's really enough motivation. And perhaps motivation's the problem. What incentive does the Victorian government have to strengthen IBAC? Victoria is essentially a one-party state at this point. And with the Andrews government into their third term, it's hard to see why the government would want to strengthen a body that would scrutinise its actions. Emboldened by a thumping win at the last election, Andrews isn't going to change, and given the opposition have managed to make themselves unelectable, there's, there's really no pressure to change at this point. In a letter sent to Parliament's presiding officers last year, the then IBAC Commissioner raised a number of concerns with the actions and behaviours of the IOC, then chaired by Labor, particularly around the IOC's alleged interference in what was supposed to be an independent performance audit of IBAC. When IBAC are quoting the company commissioned to run the IOC's independent audit into IBAC's performance as saying that they had been directed by the IOC audit subcommittee to find dirt on IBAC and data that is not readily publicly available and that the IOC was looking to support a narrative that IBAC is not performing, well that should really be raising more than just red flags. The consulting company responsible for the audit also advised IBAC that the IOC had directed them to remove sections of their report relating to IBAC funding or comments around IBAC's cooperation with the audit and that the IOC had told the consulting company that if the directed changes to what was supposedly an independent report were not made, then the report would not be approved and released. The consulting company had then advised IBAC they'd taken that to mean that they would not be paid for their work on the audit. Can you smell that? Can you? That doesn't seem right. As an interesting side note. The chair of the IOC at the time this audit was occurring was Labor MP Harriet Shing. You may remember her as the person that called... Can public. we cut the feed, please? During an inquiry in which the IBAC commissioner was being asked questions as to why Daniel Andrews had been examined in private as part of Operation Watts and Operation Sandon, as well as effectively gagging the Victorian Ombudsman from answering questions related to the Red Shirt saga. Interestingly, Shing stood down as IOC chair when she was promoted to the front bench at the end of June 2022. Another interesting side note, Shing's partner is the Premier's Chief of Staff, as reflected in her register of interests. Anyway, I digress. Daniel Andrews made a big deal about not reading this letter, because it wasn't addressed to him. I'm not here to have a debate with people who used to do a job, who've written a letter that apparently says a whole bunch of stuff. I haven't even seen the letter. But as the Premier of a state, why would you not want to read a letter from the state's anti-corruption body? Isn't it obvious, Morty? I guess after reading the letter itself, you can understand why Andrews might rather pretend it doesn't exist. It doesn't paint a rosy picture of the IOC's behaviour, and by extension his government. I'm sorry, but arguing you didn't read it because it wasn't specifically addressed to you, in this instance? Well, that's just moronic. Look, I can understand him not wanting to buy a copy of the Herald Sun to read it in there. There are plenty of other ways he could have got his hands on a copy of it. To assist the Premier, can I offer to make available a copy of Robert Redlich's letter? Besides which, I thought it should be quite clear that a letter addressed to presiding officers of Parliament was intended to be circulated to Parliament. I'm not having a debate with a bloke who used to do a job, who's written a letter I haven't seen. Well, he wrote a letter to the presiding officers. He didn't write a letter to me. Can I just ask you about something? You, you described Robert Redlich once as some guy that used to run an agency who wrote a letter. He's also, was when he wrote that letter, he was the head of the agency that did this report and other reports into your government. Do you regret using those words? Was that a lack of respect for someone who's got a really important job? Uh, I don't believe so. You'll see this a lot from Daniel Andrews when his back's against the wall. Arrogant, dismissive, refusing to acknowledge people by name or position. In doing so, he's attempting to downplay any criticism and to reduce the standing of his critics. But here's a fact. This letter wasn't just from a guy that used to do a job. It's a letter from the Victorian Commissioner of IBAC. 
that had been delivered to the government in 2022. The fact that it took months before it was leaked to the media is really irrelevant. My responsibility is to look at the 17 recommendations in an educational report, not a report delivered uh, because wrongdoing was found. That's a stretch. Um, and I'm not here to have an argument with anyone, and I'm certainly not here to have an argument with an, in, with an integrity agency that has provided us with an educational report and recommendations that we have not had time to properly consider just yet. Um, this matter was referred to IBAC. Uh, they didn't think it met the threshold. They sent it to the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman sent it back saying they didn't think it met the threshold. IBAC then conducted, they did their, did their work, uh, and it didn't meet the threshold. So they have put it for... No, it did not. No, I'm, so, no, I'm sorry. It did... No, no, no but, so you did, but see, I'm sorry, Samaya, and we, uh, let's, let's not interrupt each other. Let's stop for a moment. What um, often happens in, in cases like this, and, and, and it, it is set out in the report, there's whistleblowers uh, will make uh, allegations, and, uh, as happened in, in this case. IBEC is the clearinghouse for whistleblower allegations. And if they don't meet at the time IBAC's high threshold, they often send them to me. So we began this investigation. We worked on it for a good six months. And what became clear to us is that there was a suspicion of corrupt conduct on the part of, in this case, the Premier and two former Ministers for Health. Uh, if we have a suspicion of corrupt conduct when we're investigating something, we send it back to IBAC. We're required to. That's what the law um, requires. And IBAC can then take it on themselves, send it back to us. In this case, as we have all seen, uh, IBAC uh, retained that investigation and went on and did its own. It did not meet the threshold. There have been no findings of corrupt conduct made against anybody. But what it does do is provide IBAC with an opportunity under their, uh, their role to educate and drive continuous improvement. It does provide an opportunity for an educational report under their education functions. They're not my words. Whose were they? That's not my, I'm not, that's not my description. That is what the report is. No, it's not. And that's what IBAC says it is. No, they don't. And that's why the 17 recommendations don't recommend action be taken against individuals or any of that sort of stuff. Uh, it's, it's called an educational report because it's in fulfilment of the education obligations that the agency has under their act. What did you think of the Premier's reaction saying it was an educational report? Uh, I think it says a lot about the Premier's um, views on corruption and integrity. What does it say? It was not an educational report. It was a damning report about um, misconduct of ministerial advisers and ministerial responsibility for those advisers. It, um, it was uh, not what I would have described as an educational report. I go back to the point I made last year when IBAC and I tabled our joint Operation Watts report. There, it, it, you know, there, there is this vast area, Robert Redley has described as grey corruption, that doesn't meet this very high threshold of corruption that, it, that constitutes a criminal offence in Victoria. So, you know, what you and I, you know, and, and what, you know, what I suspect the vast majority of your listeners think of as corruption actually doesn't meet the, the legal test. But it's wrong. And it's, you know, it's, it's unethical conduct. I'm always accountable for everything that happens in the government. And what the Odd Ibex asking us to do is to uh, look at the 17 recommendations, and that's exactly what we'll do. Well, there's commentary in the report. There are no findings in the report against anyone. Do you want to comment on the commentary? No. It's not appropriate for me to be paraphrasing or commenting on commentary. No, no, no. Like, there's a narrative in this report. There are no findings against anybody. The Corruption Commission has not found any no. corrupt conduct. But the a really IBAC important point. A really talk important about, point. Now, they hang on, continually hang on, talk hang about grey corruption. Hang on a second. So it's yeah. worth talking and about, isn't it? Yes, and where, again, uh, the issues that IBAC raise in very broad, sweeping, uh, often undefined terms. Total bollocks. They've not found that anyone acted corruptly. They are, after all, the Anti-Corruption Commission, so they'd be pretty uniquely placed to make such a finding if that was appropriate. 
Deborah Glass is with you, the Ombudsman. I wanted to ask you while you were here, because of course uh, we had the, the formal report uh, from IBAC about Operation Daintree, which of course the Ombudsman's office was involved in the original investigation of the complaints that led to Operation Daintree. And I just wanted to ask you about um, your own views of the findings there and also the response of the Premier. I, it was noted by many at the time that he described it as an educational document and that, of course there were no particular findings or specific findings of corrupt behaviour. Your response to that? Well, there were no findings of corruption, but that has everything to do with the very high threshold for corruption findings that we have here in Victoria. Uh, I would describe it as a damning report. <laughs> it's, uh, it, 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 it painted a very disturbing picture of uh, the way a, a, a contract was entirely improperly uh, signed up. Um, when it, it, it shouldn't have been. Procurement processes were not followed. There was clearly pressure coming from ministerial advisers uh, and the ministers responsible for those advisers seem to be missing in action. So, you know, that, that, that is the picture that we see from the Daintree report. What consequences are there when something falls short of criminal behaviour? I saw this in my Red Shirts report. I saw it last year in our Operation Watts report. There are multiple findings that, you know, that, that, that we have seen in, in previous reports where conduct falls short of criminal but is wrong. It is unethical. It is improper. It breaches codes. So the problem for me is not so much about the threshold or definition as what happens when behaviour falls short of that very high criminal threshold but is unethical, is wrong and there are no consequences. Well, I back describes it that way. Just to be... No, hang on. Just, I'll, you, I'll, I'll, I'll absolutely let you finish your question and then I'll answer it. But it is just important, though. It's not me calling it that. That's what I back call it. Total bollocks. It's a matter, matter for I back. It's a matter for I back. It's a matter for I back. It's a matter for I back. Victoria is in a very precarious position. Like I said before, it's essentially a one-party state right now. The Liberal Party are fighting amongst themselves and positioning themselves as increasingly irrelevant as they move further towards the fringes. It's not surprising that the opposition leader is now being asked questions like this. Is the Victorian Liberal Party deliberately trying to make itself irrelevant? No. And this is bad for everyone. If you've been paying attention, you might be starting to notice the issues that creep into politics when the two-party system is effectively reduced to one. Things like accountability start to take a back seat, and integrity becomes an even more aspirational concept. The checks and balances provided by opposition slowly disappear. There's no drive for the government to do better. The Victorian government's approach toward integrity and IBAC is a prime example. There was another finding in this report that we've seen pop up in a few of the other IBAC investigations, and that's around ministerial advisers. Hypothetically, collecting a stable of ministerial advisers is a perfect way for an MP to escape any accountability, as experts have pointed out before. Ministers can use advisers as scapegoats. It's easy to say, I didn't know, I wasn't advised, the advisor acted alone, or, dare I say it, I can't recall. The inability for ministers to recall a whole range of things when giving evidence to IBAC is a constant throughout the Operation Daintree report. What memories? I'm like a goldfish over here. Ministerial advisers can also act as blockers, preventing information moving from the public service to the relevant minister, providing the minister with some plausible deniability. If the public service was to provide advice that the minister may not like, potentially the ministerial advisor may decide not to pass that on, hypothetically, of course. Of course. There's been a continuing increase in the concentration of power around the head of government and their office. In Victoria, we can see this concentration occurring with the number of staff in the Premier's private office, increasing from around 20 in 2011 to 87 in 2019-20, and at the time of delivering this paper, in excess of 90. In Victoria, 287 ministerial advisers were employed, employed in 2021. By contrast to the United Kingdom, which employs 113 special advisers during that same period, despite the fact that the British civil service is almost 10 times larger than the Victorian public service. The dangers of concentration of governance in one place is obvious. There is the ever-present risk 
that a concentration of power and influence may corrupt ethical standards. The centralisation of government has profound implications for the other arms of executive government and inevitably affects how they discharge their responsibilities. New risks arise through, through the potential, potential reach of this swelling group of advisers that provide their leader with a greater capacity to influence those who are required to make a decision with little or no public transparency as to how it occurs. The danger is compounded because of the increasing influence of each, each minister's advisers and their symbiotic relationship with the advisers in the Prime Minister or Premier's office. As the Grattan Institute has recognised, advisers are increasingly drawn from political back backgrounds rather than the public service. They are likely to discourage ministers from pursuing an unpop unpopular policy and to they ensure that keep, they keep the minister out of political trouble. This rapid growth of advisers has allowed them to become greatly influential in government decision making with little or no attention being paid to the regulation of their role. Advisers have been described as a largely fluid, unregulated universe, which can be contrasted with the elaborate administrative law accountability frameworks to which ministers and public servants are subject. They have been called, quote, a black hole of accountability, through which advisers can provide plausible deniability to ministers, while by convention, they cannot be called to appear before parliamentary committees. The advisor is seen as the minister's alter ego. Public servants typically take advice from what the advisor says to reflect the minister's position. Advisors may have a broad authorising environment from their minister, or they may act entirely independently of the minister. Ministerial advisers will reach out directly to public service departments rather than going through the responsible minister's office. Public servants will not generally know with what authority the advisor speaks. These blurred boundaries result in ministerial advisers inappropriately influencing the advice, decisions and administrative actions of public, public servants. This accountability deficit can be used to obvious political advantage. There's no doubting now that to the detriment of Victoria, IBAC is very much a toothless tiger. It needs teeth, but it won't be given any so long as the Andrews government are without any legitimate competition. It'll be interesting to see how IBAC and issues around integrity play out through the remainder of Daniel Andrews' current term as Premier. IBAC needs significant changes. There are still a number of IBAC investigations in play, including the long-rumoured but only relatively recently confirmed Operation Richmond, which has been running for many, many years now. There's another inquiry that is widely believed to be underway and it's never been confirmed or denied. Is there an investigation into the Firefighters Union? There was. Was past tense? Was. The, the investigation concluded probably 18 months ago. It's a draft that's being prepared and we wait whilst litigation takes place. Is that what's called Operation Richmond? Correct. Why has that draft report not been made public? Because there are, there's litigation on a number of fronts. It could still be a very long time before it sees the light of day. I'll end by saying this. If you're prepared to wave through what's happening in Victoria, but you're paying close attention and highly vocal about what's happened in New South Wales. You are such a hypocrite.